Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, Book of Mark, chapter 20, uh, 9, verse 20 here in a moment. You know, Mark being just a youth that kind of hung around and hung out with the disciples because they stayed many times at his mother's home. And he was an eyewitness to many of the things that happened. It's the shortest of the Gospels, but some think it was even the first written. But be that as it may, uh, it's vivacious, it moves, and it's a fantastic uh, report from the eyes of a youth that I witnessed this and brings it to our eyes. The disciples have just attempted to cast out an evil spirit out of a lad, and they can't cut it. And this is strange because Christ had given them the power to do this. But evidently this was quite a sight. Um, we'll pick it up in the 20th verse of chapter 9 and maybe you can kind of see for yourself and we'll, we'll cover it from there. So with a word of wisdom from our Father, chapter 9 verse 20, let's go with it. Um, and um, that particular verse um, would read, And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. This is a bad one, okay. 21, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. He had it all of his life. So. And you know from the book of Matthew, it's called a lunatic, lunar from the moon. And uh, when, when we have a full moon, all police departments, hospitals, emergency rooms, you're always going to have things pick up because of the play on mankind. And this being a prime example, Christ tells us how to handle it. Listen carefully. Verse 22, And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if, now watch that word if, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That shows a little bit of faith. But he's still, you see a little bit of doubt, if you can do this. Well, the disciples had failed. So Christ is going to cut him a little bit of slack, no doubt, because of that. Verse 23, And Jesus said unto him, If, um, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. In other words, you want, you want to let that settle into your mind. In other words, belief is what makes it possible. So what Christ, what Christ is saying here is that um, the problem is not if I can do it. The problem is with God, all things are possible. The problem is do you, the big if is, do you have the faith to believe? All things are possible to him that believeth. Now you want to remember that. Remember that verse, verse 24, and straightway, that means immediately, the father of the child cried out and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thine mine unbelief. And that's fair, that's good. When you have a weakness and you're not even sure, ask for his help. There's no penalty for that. That's being honest. And when, when you ask our Father for help, you know, a lot of people will have a, a habitual uh, thing in their life, a habit they can't break, and they'll make promises to God, I'm going to quit this, and I'm going to quit, and I'm going to quit. And I'm... Instead of making promises, why don't you ask His help 
to help you stop whatever it is, if it's harming your health or whatever. All you have to do is just ask him. So the man has asked. He said, I, uh, um, help my unbelief. Verse 25, and when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I, this is not the disciples, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, this is Emmanuel, God with us, I, change, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Final. Okay. It's not the disciples, not somebody else. This is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I, that's emphatic. Verse 26, and the spirit cried and rid him sore and came out of him and he was at, as one dead insomuch that many said, he is dead. And naturally this, this uh, spirit had wore him out. I mean, had uh, all but destroyed him. <clears throat> Verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose, strengthened him. 28, and when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? Why couldn't we do it? Now listen carefully. And he said unto them, this kind, well, what kind is that? This is important, the lunatic from Lunar, can come forth by nothing but by, fair, by prayer and fasting. Now, what does that mean? Well, what does prayer do? Prayer brings faith. Prayer by hearing the Word of God brings faith. Hearing the Word of God brings faith. Knowing of a truth and a fact. But fasting, what does that have to do with it? As it's written in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, in the end times, Father will send upon this earth a famine, not for bread, but a famine for hearing the word of God. And that famine is today. There is a famine here. You must fast from the things and the traditions of men and the ways of the world and pray to God for the real truth where the famine in the land is for hearing that truth, whereby you have that dunamis, that power, through Christ that it's done. You in yourself can usually, you're not going to do much. But in his name, when you hook into that power and authority by asking it in his name, all things are possible to those that believe. Now, I, I want to I go back to Matthew chapter 17. You're not going to have it, but listen to me read Matthew's report of this same incident. Mark is good, but Matthew goes a little more into depth. Verse 15, the Lord, this man speaking, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic, giving you the kind, and sore vexed and oftentimes falling in the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they, they could not cure him. 17, then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. In other words, uh, he, he was going to be crucified soon. And that's why he's telling them, 18. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour, not next week, not a week later, then. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Why couldn't we cut it? 20, and Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith uh, as a grain of a mustard seed, tiny, tiny, and it's the real thing, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible 
unto you. Mountain signifies nation, and if it's a crooked nation, if you so have the faith, you can do something about it. Just as 10 people sitting on a church step in, in East Berlin in prayer and leading drew down the wall that stood between the two, uh, city, the city of Berlin. Verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth out, not out, but by prayer and fasting. And so it was, and as, as I stated, that prayer and fasting, prayer brings faith. That hearing the word of God brings faith. The, the real word, reading it, studying it, analyzing it, listening to it, opening your spiritual ears to hear what thus saith the Lord God. And with that, and that only, do you have that truth and the armor that penetrates? And uh, you might say, well, why wouldn't the disciples have done this before? They went, went out by twos and came back saying the evil spirits are subject to us. Well, there, this was right direct from old Satan himself. And let me tell you something. When you see a sight such as this lad was, frothing, growling, foaming, uh, if, you have, if you have a weak heart, if you have a weak system, you're going to have some doubts. You're going to be afraid. It, and it's not a, it is an awful thing to see. But with faith and power, all things are possible with the living God. So it does take that authority. You, have, you must have Christ himself do it through you in his name. It is done. Okay, let's continue then with chapter 9, verse 30, as we pick it back up there again. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, the old circuit there, and he would not that any man should know it. Um, he was trying, he was preparing his disciples here for his departure. That's, that's what this is about. 31. For he taught his disciples and he said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. They're going to crucify him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise on the third day. It's going to happen. You can expect it. And here he's preparing them mentally, spiritually, uh, for this event that's going to happen. And certainly, if they were familiar with Psalms 22, it was already written a thousand years before why it had to come to pass and how it would come to pass that they would crucify him, pull his arms out of socket and so forth, pierce his arms and feet. All in Psalms 22 written, recorded God's plan. Verse 32, but they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. They, they would rather fight. Okay. You know, Peter already once had been rebuked by Christ himself because he said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to allow this. We'll go down fighting. And they, uh, Peter, as you'll remember, on the night that Christ was uh, betrayed, Peter drew a sword and sliced, the, lobbed the ear off of one named Malchus, a uh, high priest's uh, servant. And Christ picked the ear up and placed it back on, healed the man. So, yeah, Peter was quite a swordsman. So these, these were not penny waste by any means. These were troopers, troopers you could ride with, certainly. Uh, they, didn't want to, they didn't want to hear any more about it, quite frankly, 30, for that moment, 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that ye disputed about among yourselves by the way? He'd heard it. He knew, he knew what they were talking about. Quite frankly, it was <clears throat> which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom. That's um, uh, something that uh, now they would be ashamed of. 34. And, um, and uh, 34 reads, but they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Which one of us? Won't that popularity? 35. And he sat down and he called the twelve and he saith unto them, If any man 
desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Now, now, now think about that a moment. It's not difficult. Why did Christ wash the feet of the disciples? I mean, he's, he's God with us. That, that, that is serving them. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the only begotten Son. And here he's washing the feet of the twelve, serving them. Because when you are the greatest, you are a servant to all, if you're honest in God's Word. That's the way it is. Being, being um, best versed, best led by God Himself, does not elevate you. It brings you to that point of servant to all, to if, attempt to save every soul that is possible with truth and with the very Word of God. That's what he's talking about here. Christ himself was a servant. Verse 36, And he took a child, going to give an analogy here, and he set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, this is very tender, 37, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. I'm feeding my sheep. That's what he's talking about. Now, you know, how is a little child? If a little child loves you and trusts you, they're going to believe every word you tell them. They're not going to doubt. And that's what Christ is talking about. When, when to, to see the kingdom, to be a part, you've got to be as a little child. You've got to believe. That's why he was able to cast out that demon. Belief. So, and, and that's how a child is. You, you've all witnessed this. You know it. Verse 38, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. And he followed not us. And we forbade him because he followed not us. Now, analyze that real good. Think that scripture over. Lock it in. 39, And Jesus said, Forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. Verse 40, For he that is not against us is on our part. Now, uh, do you understand what kind of upset them and why Christ is kind of dressing them down a little bit? They didn't say, they didn't say, uh, John or the others, um, uh, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he doesn't follow us. And we forbid him because he followed not us. The idea is not to follow man. The idea is to follow Christ. You understand? That's, that separates truth from fiction, success from failure. You start following man and you're going to be in one heap of hurt. You follow Christ. That's who this person was following, not the disciples, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name, he had the power to accomplish these things. Just a little teaching thought. You want to pay attention to the scripture. Verse 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ. What was that? Because you're really a good old boy? No, because you belong to Christ. You're doing Christ's work. Verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. It will be in his favor. Okay. Now, um, verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones 
that believe in me. What was the qualification? That believe in me. It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. It, God kind of takes care of his own. You know, a lot of you fear pretty easily. You don't have to. If you believe and if you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a protector. You have a comforter. It's called the Holy Spirit. And you have God's wing over you. As long as you utilize common sense to protect yourself, then he's going to take care of the rest of it. Verse 43, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. This word hell here is Gehenna. It's not hellfire and brimstone. In other words, it's a garbage pit outside of Jerusalem that burns night and day and, and so forth. But what is he talking about? You know, ignorance is bliss, and if you're not careful, you can get in a lot of trouble right here. And it, it can cause some people to even turn against Christianity by say, misinterpreting that particular scripture. Well, he would want you to cut your hand off. No, not at all. That's not the point. <clears throat> what is the body of Christ or those that work in Christ or those that believe in Christ? It's the many-membered body of Christ. It's made up of many churches, many beliefs, many groups, uh, many gatherings. And what he's saying here, if, if you have one group over here that goes haywire, they start teaching the traditions of man and turn away from the real truth of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse and start bringing a bunch of malarkey and men's traditions, you get rid of them. Don't you fellowship with them. You cut yourself away from them. It's better to lose a part that goes bad than it is for the whole body of Christ to go to hell or to be embarrassed. Get rid of them nip it in the bud. You don't need uh, crack pots. This is why Christ would tell you when he fed the 5,000 and then the four and they picked up the fragments. He said, when you got a bunch of people around, you're going to pick up some fragments that are lies, doctrines of, of men that make void the word of God. You've got to expect that and you've got to be bigger than that and you've got to handle it. So there, there you have it. No, not that God would have you cut a hand off. That's, he, he created these bodies the way they are, and he wants them left that way. Okay? But when it comes to the spiritual many-membered body, there is a time that you have to sometimes, uh, uh, people get their little hands working too much, doing man's work rather than God's. Get rid of it. Okay? Now, next verse, please. And the next verse being 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, you know, this just really frightens a lot of people and they don't understand what Gehenna is. Gehenna being the garbage pit outside of Jerusalem, Christ uses an analogy of what hell would be like. Well, because they would throw dead animals on it and naturally the worms would work in and out. And it would, made a good prime example of what hell would be like. Um, uh, when your soul ceased to be. 45, as it's written in Revelation chapter 20, the last three verses. Verse 45, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell and into the fire that never shall be quenched. A lot of people think this is repetition. Not necessarily so. Hands and feet are two different things. Hands uh, handle different works and accomplish works, and unfortunately, some, one went bad. With feet, you get travelers and this, that, and the other, and sometimes traveling to the wrong place gets the many-membered body. Don't let it suffer. Cut it off. Get rid of it. You don't need somebody that's a troublemaker. Get rid of them. 
and, and maybe they'll repent and repair. Who knows? That's up to them. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That old smoldering pit outside Jerusalem goes night and day. 47, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Now, the seeing eye is, is a prophet or somebody that's supposed to see truth. If you get some would-be person calling themselves a prophet, you, you've got prophets, you've got Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of the minor prophets, and um, even David was a prophet. A lot of people don't realize that. Enoch was a prophet. Have all kinds of prophets you've got to draw from. But when you have some seer that starts seeing things that don't exist, get rid of him and get rid of the group. You don't need them. Verse 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The old Gehenna, take a look at it and you'll see an example. 49, for everyone shall be salted with fire. You want to let that sink in good. How, how many did it say part? No, for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. That, that's required. Well, what is this salted with fire? Well, what is God? As it is written in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12, um, uh, the, God is a consuming fire. And, and so He is. God is a consuming fire. You can count on it. And um, uh, it's going to be salted. He's going to see to it. Do you know? Do you know where this um, where this uh, comes from? Is Leviticus chapter two, verse thirteen. I'm going to. You won't have it. I'm going to read it to you. Leviticus of the law, chapter two, verse thirteen. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering with which uh, with all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. So salt is necessary for life even. God's seen to that. He, he, he observed that and so it was. You know, before we had refrigeration, salt preserved meat. When, when you... Um, packed meat down in salt, it cured it, whereby it would not spoil that rapidly, and, um, and so it would be. And, and so it is when God kindles with His fire, it gets rid of all that offends. It gets rid of those that would get the rest of the family in trouble, and, and protects and salts with truth and the very warmth of God, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that consuming fire to you is the glow in your heart for, of the touch of the living God. That's your salt when He is with you in that way. One more verse to complete that, verse 50. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost his saltiness, Wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Now, what does this mean? Well, you know, some salt does. They'll overheat it and many other things until it to totally loses. It, you would have to use a, uh, double the amount to get kind of a little bit of a salty taste and that will hurt you. But when you take real salt, sea salt or mine salt that has not been heated, that has not been cooked into oblivion, then, then certainly it, it, it only takes a little bit. It's good for the body. You know, I have seen men in the desert salted. That is not funny. That is a very serious thing. Men will die without salt.
in, in, a, in hot temperature. But if, if salt loses its saltiness, then it's no good. You might as well throw it out in the street. Well, a man or a woman that has lost their ability to change the flavor of, of the spirituality of a condition is also of none effect. They've lost their saltiness. To be a little salty makes a difference. It changes things. It changes from bland, a bland taste, to a delicious taste. It's palatable. It's good. Salt is good. It's one of, the, one of the best minerals that God has ever put upon this earth, though I know the medical community would have you believe you should drop it all. Uh, we leave them to their teaching, and I will teach the Word of God. But there is a difference in prepared, burned uh, salt that has been overheated so it, you know, we just don't want it to clump for people and it'll sell better. It'll kill them, but you know, it won't clump. You know, you don't, you can just, but where real salt will clump, that's not going to hurt you. All you got to do is put a dry cracker or a rice cube in with it or something and it'll draw the moisture and you've got good salt and, and it'll be healthy for you. And you yourself, be a little salty in the Spirit of God. Don't be so bland that uh, people don't want to hear you. And let that saltiness, which is the very Spirit of God, make that difference in you. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii. Hey, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you've got a question, you want to share it, go for it, okay? Please never, though, ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We don't judge people. We have a judge. It's our father. You leave that in his hand and you simply discern right from wrong and follow be salty and follow god's word you'll do good those of you that listen by short wave around the world it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address now got a prayer request you don't need the number nor an address why god knows what you're thinking do you know do you know um, it may be hard for you to believe but he loves you that's why he created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different, fingerprints different. You're unique, just the way he wanted you. But he does want you to love him. Otherwise, you're kind of a disappointment to him. And you sure don't want to be one of those that's cut off. You want to let him know you love him and ask his help in anything that you might need. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Michael from Florida. Good to see you back, and great uh, big thanks to Dennis for a well-informed study on kings. Well, we appreciate him. We do, and thank you. What were these pesky scribes writing and if they sat in the seat of Moses? Uh, did they change the law? 
And you betcha, that's what it was all about. They tried to. That's why Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 23, the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. He was the lawgiver. And so it was. Uh, you know, as a student of the manuscripts, because you know in First, Corinthians, First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, the Kenites were already scribes for the tribe of Judah, then you better watch Judah's writings, or that is to say the record keeping after that, because the scribes had it going their way. Uh, but a, a good scholar can handle it, no, nothing to sweat. Uh, Bullard from Florida, my question comes from the Gospel of Mark 13:32. How can the son not know something the father knows if the father and the son are the same person? Saint Emmanuel is God with us, but God said, let us create man in our image, and in the flesh you do not have the full Godhead. We're talking about offices here, and, and naturally the thing you're talking about is where Christ would say, uh, no one except the Father knows the exact instant that the end comes, and, uh, and that's a true fact. But um, just as the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God and the, the Father and, God and the Son, only begotten, it, it is our comforter. But that in itself is something He promised, and it is a comfort, His Spirit. Ralph from Washington, I made a salt covenant with a church, and when I found out they believe in the rapture, am I bound by the salt covenant to that church now, or can I leave? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm going to say that probably you made that salt covenant to God. And if you find out God isn't there, then you're, you're free from it, okay? Many, many people, uh, God doesn't send out beggars, okay? And if someone conned you into making a covenant to a church, meaning to God, that would be their line. You need to promise God. Well, if God's not there, then you need to go where God is. Audrey from Virginia, how many times are we supposed to take communion? I, I like to follow Christ's example. He cut the wake, and if you always follow his example, you're in good shape. Uh, he said, take it as oft as you meet, and they met three times a year, Passover, Pentecost, and fall fellowships. Now, there were times that a person is ill or something and you need to take communion. You can take communion anytime you want to. But that, and, and I must uh, say that is my opinion, but it is based on uh, the Word of Christ. Rachel from Massachusetts, where in the Bible does it say we are to obey the laws of the land? Uh, Romans chapter 13, there is no government in power except God hath ordained it. It's for a purpose. Sometimes negative, sometimes positive, and, um, and so it is. Uh, why does it say in Romans 13 to obey the law? Well, we obey the laws of this nation because we have a license to broadcast God's Word to the world. And as that nation, its constitution guarantees our right to do that. That um, and, and no one can prevent that because we have freedom of religion by uh, our very constitution. And naturally, if, if you break to the laws of the land, you're going to lose all that. It's that simple. Uh, Eric from Virginia, question, were the apostles married? Did God require the apostles or ministers of his word to remain celibate? in order to serve him. I think not. Could you? Well, no, he, he didn't say be celibate. He said celebrate. He said just celebrate all you want to, all right? Um, uh, what did it say in Mark chapter 1, verse 30, when we first, the very first chapter we started? Peter was married. His, his wife's mother was ill. And, um, and some of them were married. Some of them weren't. Paul wasn't married. But Prisca and Aquila, Aquila uh, was a, a pretty good teacher, and the first time they're mentioned, Aquila's name, the male is first. 
But then Priscilla, who Paul kind of had a pet name for, Prisca, because she was one some kind of a preacher. So after that, Priscilla's name is first. So Aquila was certainly married. And as a matter of fact, his wife was even a preacher. And from Georgia, do horses sweat? They foam if you ride them too hard. I mean, they froth up and foam. And, and that makes them, that, that they do have the sweat glands, but their hoof is not right if you're thinking about the food laws. Do not eat horse meat. There are good buddies that have worked for us, done a good job, transportation, um, animals of commerce, uh, loyal, loving, but um, they do not have a split hoof, but they do sweat. And where she's getting this probably from is she's heard me say pigs or swine have no sweat glands. They are scavengers and God designed them so that they can eat all the poison, grub, scavenger, eat anything. And the poison is stored in the fat of the body of the pig. And that's why he said, probably you ought not eat that. William from um, Virginia, thank you for your program. When you talk about when we die and our spirit return us to the Father, were we alive in heaven before and then sent down here and then we go back? Can you please clarify this for me? No man has descended from heaven that will not ascend back, even Christ himself as he did. Another second scripture to that is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it says in verse 14, if you believe Christ rose and returned to heaven and you better or you're not a Christian, then you better believe everybody that sleeps in him has also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. Well, where did they come from? They came from Almighty God. And you can read in Job chapter 38 that the sons of God, which there, there's, there's no gender in that. It means the children of God. We're all laughing and having great time in the first earth age until Satan rebelled. Uh, this is why God would say I, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this world age, meaning from the first. Yes, you were there. Alan from Texas. Where is it written about the different races going on to the ark? Thank you. Re Genesis chapter 6, Noah was told to, in as much as all of the races were created on the sixth day, Adam, and then on the eighth day, Etha Adam was created and a wife given him Eve. But the sixth day creation were flesh, as it is written in 6.3, Genesis, that's chapter 6, verse 3, it grieved God that he had now made man flesh also. Not because they were sinning. But then he did tell Noah, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. People make a bad mistake when they think we're just talking about animals. No, man was flesh also. Genesis 6, 3, read it. But then in that same sixth chapter of Genesis is where he said, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Okay. So they weren't destroyed. Look around you today. They're all here. Uh, John from Georgia. When the devil's time is cut back to five months, is that in our time or is that in the Lord's time? That's in our time. It is a five-month period. Uh, your documentation for that is what God uses many times horticulture or uh, husbandry your knowledge of that as a farmer or an agriculture person to document. Well, how do I know the five months? Revelation chapter 9, the, 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 the um, locust. It is the locust army. And that particular siege of the locust lasts five months from May through September. So you see, he gives you a great deal of knowledge and guarantees a five-month season of our time. Kim from Oklahoma. What do the letters next to the scriptures mean? What do they refer to? You do not 
ask a complete question, I'm going to assume that you're talking about a companion Bible. Companion Bible, a companion Bible, which I highly recommend is the best study Bible man can attain, is outlined. In other words, each chapter is outlined so that you know who's them and they's and um, it's. You know who, what this is talking about because there is an outline and the outline will begin with a number and above and then below as their two are connected. And look at the outline and study the letters as they are given to the subject. And then as it is given in the column and the verse, you'll know you're there. Uh, Dennis has the work on how to study the Bible and it will uh, assist you a great deal on that. Robin from Tennessee, would you please give me the scriptures that talk about the three world ages? Well, there's a lot of them. Second Peter chapter three gives you all three of them, but they are ages. It's the same world, the same heaven, and uh, but but different ages of time, and certainly Second uh, Peter chapter three gives you all three of them. But Genesis chapter one verse two, God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth. Period. Millions of years ago, and then in verse two. The Hebrew manuscripts are different than your King James. It didn't say the earth was void. It said the earth became void and without form because of Satan's rebellion. Uh, God doesn't create anything void and without form. Um, Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 documents that. It, the, he created the earth to be inhabited. Okay, Elizabeth from South Carolina. I would like information about Enoch. Was he a great prophet, teacher, or a writer? If he wrote only books, did they survive the great? No, they, he did not write books, okay? Um, Jude, the great book of Jude, there's only one chapter, and in the 14th verse, it says that Enoch was a prophet, okay? Well, what was Enoch prophesying? Why, why did God just take him? Because the fallen angels were intermixing with the daughters of Adam and corrupting everything, and he was pounding the stump, teaching, preaching, I mean, take, try, uh, telling people, you got to stop this. And, and uh, probably being one of the very few, uh, Noah would listen to him before, as it is written in Genesis 6, Noah was the only family, sons, wives, and daughters that had a perfect pedigree, meaning they had mixed with the fallen angels. They were not hybrids like many of the others were. And God saw fit uh, that through them would come Messiah. And that's why he kept that line pure. Uh, Annette from Missouri, how do, you conf how do you discern from all the different religions present today, what is true from the faults? <clears throat> it's real easy. God sent you this letter. And if, if somebody doesn't go along with that letter, they're probably false. But it's, it's real simple. All you have to do is go by what our Father teaches you through the Son today example. If they don't follow that line, Cut yourself off from them. How do I determine that? By the Word of God. That's why you must study the Word of God to show yourself approved. Rightly dividing it, meaning time, people, subject, what's it talking about, object, and so forth, and understanding. It's not that difficult. A child can understand the simplicity in which Christ teaches if you move away all the smoke that man stirs to where you can't see clearly to the bottom. Just let, just let the word flow and you'll do just fine. Um, uh, Penophily, um, when, from Oregon, when the time comes and it uh, says to run to the mountains 
or don't turn to go back to your house and so forth. I'm not sure where to run to. I don't know anyone else here that belongs to Shepherd's Chapel and I'm not sure what to do. Well, it, it's a figure of speech, okay? And it means whatever you do, don't go back to any old way of doing. Christ is going to return and the Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what to do. You're not to, as, as we will learn in the 13th chapter coming up in this book of Mark, you will learn exactly what you're supposed to do and uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to use you and talk to you. Um, we have a destiny to witness, not to... <clears throat> running is simply if you're in the land of Judea and uh, where, where the destruction of God cleansing Mount Zion, otherwise you're in good shape. Uh, Pastor Murray, where can I find a verse related to the United States of America? That's uh, Gene from Texas. I like to use Isaiah chapter 18, a land divided by rivers. And naturally, there is a reason the United States of America is a superpower of superpowers, though she's a little bent right now. We'll get the, we'll get the buckles out of it. No problem. We're a people that can come back from nothing to everything. And uh, wisdom always prevails. And ever so often you have this group that will come along and try to drive God out of our nation. That's impossible. He's the one that built this nation. In God we trust and always have, always will. Our very laws themselves came from the very common law from Great Britain, which is to say the Word of God. That's where our laws, common law, comes from. That's our, the very constitution of this nation. The reason it has great wisdom is it came from that word, common law. And certainly when we follow that, we always recover and we do just fine when we get rid of the knuckleheads, okay, that would try to take that away from us. Uh, okay, um, and I'm not calling anybody names. That's just a fact, all right? I always go by facts. If you're a knucklehead, you're a knucklehead, all right? That's the way we old Marines talk, all right? Because it's the truth. Okay, Pastor Murray, uh, this is uh, uh, Brax Bracton from California, age 12. Why is the fig tree generation this bad, especially in these times? The kids are ignorant heathens at my public school from Bratton, from California. Well, I'm not going to give your town, okay? Um, it, it is true that I believe, and this is my opinion, all that a third of God's children followed Satan in the first earth age. They worshiped him. And I do believe that God saved those souls to be born in this final generation of the fig tree, whereby Satan will appear again. Will they worship him again? Well, uh, you know, he's got a pretty good hold on all the people around so far. There are more people really that favor him than they do Christ. Uh, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? But you hang tough. We have the majority as far as truth is concerned. And I've read the back of the book. We win. So don't you let them shake you up on your first cruise. You're doing real good. You keep studying. Show yourself approved. And use common sense everywhere. And God will take care of business, okay? Um, Rita from Alabama. All... All those years of past pastors, I was taught the rapture doctrine and many other false interpretations. I want to share with you how this affected me. You are my pastor, and if I could get to grab it, I'd come, but I can't. Some of the other members of, may feel the same way about these false prophets. I'm angry with them, so, so much so. I typed a notice and placed it on my front door. This notice quotes Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 19 through 24, and under it that if God was against us, them, then so were the inhabitants of my household, and they weren't welcome here. Well, you're, you're pretty, you're staunch, and you got it going there. 
Let God lead. Always uh, be gracious. And you're, you'll do just fine. It's good to hear from you. Carolyn from Arkansas. Where, in, where is the verse in the Bible that says Jerusalem is God's favorite place? Well, it, it's um, Ezekiel chapter 16. He, he loves her. He said, you were born an unclean birth. You weren't even swaddled. Why? Because Jerusalem was formed by the Jebusites. They called her Jebus. And then, then David came along and captured her and changed her name to Yerushalayim. And God said, I, I, when you grew into a mature woman, I fell in love with you. Now, he's using this analogy of a city, but it is God's favorite place. And, and though he gets disappointed in that 16th chapter at her occasionally, the last two verses, I believe it is, if my memory doesn't fail me, and I don't think it does, he says, I make an eternal covenant with you. That's, that's his home. That's where the heavenly Jerusalem will be placed. And God's throne will be established there. Revelation chapter 21 documents that. Okay, William, and I'm, William, we'll get to you tomorrow. I'm out of time. I love you all for a real special reason. Why? Because you love studying the Word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it. Makes His day. And when you, I'm talking to you, when you make His day, boy, is He going to bless you. You're going to have a good one. You can count on it. Father loves those that love Him. Father protects those that love Him. It's so very, very important. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good now. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day even when there's trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.